don't let the world make you choose if you're black or white. Be who you are. Um, you know, my mother taught me that my job on the planet was to leave the world a better place than how I found it. So your your goal in life is to to contribute something to the world to make it better, whatever that is, whatever that is. And exposure matters. Um, you know, talk to people, be in other places, travel do things that you normally wouldn't do put yourself in situations where there are people that are not like you different religions different you know value system and you know learn in in that way i think you have to sit down and have a conversation with your partner about what your goals are for your children and everything else follows from that we'll discuss race and how it plays a factor and how we didn't even talk about this topic because we were afraid A Black Executive Perspective. Welcome to a Black Executive Perspective podcast, a safe space where we discuss all matters related to race, especially race in corporate America. I'm your host, Tony Tippett. In a previous episode titled Too Black to be White and Too White to be Black, we heard from several teenagers about the difficulties they encounter as as biracial individuals. Now we're giving the floor to their parents to share their perspectives on the complexities of interracial relationships. In addition, they'll discuss everything from facing public discrimination, navigating their children's identity challenges, and dealing with the effects of racial microaggressions, a form of discrimination that subtle, deeply affects individuals and families. Ladies, welcome to a Black Executive Perspective podcast. Good afternoon. Hello. Good. Awesome. I see you guys are chomping at the bit already, huh? <laughs> so it's all good. So look, let's let's introduce everyone so everybody gets to know who you are. Let's start from the left. Your name, tell us a little bit about your occupation and uh, the racial makeup between you and your spouse. Hello, my name is Lindsay. Um, I'm a teacher. I have two children. I have a son and a daughter, and their father is African American. Thanks, Lindsay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. My name is Erica. I'm a judge, and I have two daughters with a white father. Welcome, Erica. Hello, my name is Shannon. I'm an account executive, and my husband is black, and I have a son and a daughter. Welcome, Shannon. So, ladies, thank you for coming here. Obviously, you it's uh, you guys have busy families so for you to take the time to come and talk about this topic, really appreciate it. But that's the question that I want to ask you. Um, why did you want to come on? You know, obviously your kids were on and they talked about their stories. What compelled you to come on a black executive perspective to give your point of view on this topic? Let's start with you first, Shannon. Thank you. Um, I think it's just really important to have a conversation, like you're saying, with the whole podcast series. It's important to talk about it, make people feel comfortable, um, let people know a little bit about, I guess, how it is to be in my shoes or your shoes or our children's shoes and just understand other people and their situations. For me, it was the title. Um, Just the title of this podcast reminded me of my own college experience. Um, both my mother and father are are black, but I went to a lily white school. There were 3,000 or so students, 60 of us were black. And I was not black enough for the black students, but I wasn't white. So I found myself on this island by myself. Mm. And it, you know, and I didn't grow up in this country. And so um, it really had some identity issues that came up for me. So the title was what? What brought me? Plus, my daughter did the podcast, so I'm happy to, you know, book in that with with my views on this. All right. Well, thank you, Lindsay. Um, after my son participated in the podcast, Gail and I actually were spending some time together, having some conversations, which had a lot more. Um, my son had not experienced or thought he didn't experience things that I had to remind him about. He also didn't take in his sister's perspective on how she had dealt with many of the things, the girls that participated in. And I felt like it needed a further discussion. 
And I also needed to remind him not everyone has the same thick skin he has. So although those experiences shaped him to who he is today, that um, he needs to also acknowledge and recognize how hurtful things are that may not hurt him personally, mm -hmm. but do hurt our family or other children that are um, biracial. So let's back up a little bit, because obviously we want to talk about today and your kids and stuff, but let's just take a step back. So I'm going to start with you first, Erica, because you talked about where you were born. So let's, where did you, where, where are you originally from? Talk a little bit about your racial makeup. You spoke a little bit to it earlier, and then I'm going to, and then we'll move on. I just want to get a little background of where you're from, your racial makeup growing up, and then I, I'm, I'm going to ask you another question. Okay. So I was actually born in Springfield, Massachusetts to a single black mother, a, a college student. My father also was black. And uh, my mother worked for the Department of Defense. So I grew up in Germany from the age of five until I graduated from high school. And so my experience with race relations was very different. I went to American schools and the children in the schools with me, my classmates were mostly military children, even though I wasn't military, you know, my mother was civilian, but so I went to, it was a very um, diverse student body, but <clears throat> the military is one of the few places where um, integration is, is mandated, right? There, there, there isn't a, um, there's no segregation. There's no, there. Yeah, there's no segregation. And it sounds odd to say in 2024 about that, but um, the military is one of those places where, you know, everyone was sort of on the same. It was very diverse. Yes, very diverse. And I came to the United States to go to college, which was a complete shock to me because I went to college with, the, for example, a very good friend of mine who is still a friend of mine today went to a school with everyone was black. And when I saw her yearbook freshman year, I said, where are all the white people? Or where are all the, like everyone from the janitor to the superintendent was black. And that was an experience I had never had. I had a very international, my friends didn't speak English, had never been to the U.S. Had, we were all pretty much well-traveled. Most of us spoke different languages. I rode horses. I ran track. I listened to quote unquote white music. Like I, my experience growing up was very different, I think, had I stayed in Springfield, Massachusetts, or, or, or grew up here. So going to, um, I won't name my college, but going to my university um, was, was a culture shock for me. And I didn't have the experience of that black was something that I needed to be. It's something that I was. There were, you know, the expectations of American students, you know, my peers, was so foreign to me. I, I didn't understand why the mu the way I spoke or the music I listened to or the things I was interested in w was being monitored in that way. And so I had a crash course in race relations in the U.S., you know, just by coming back and, and going to, to school. So, you know, the identity issues, even though I was black, you know, other black students made me question that, um, which is odd. So in other words... <laughs> When you were international, it wasn't an issue. Was not an issue. And right? that's not to say there wasn't racism. No, no, but in terms of your identity and stuff to that nature, it wasn't an issue. It was not then an issue. then when you came to America, all right, then all of a sudden your race became forefront. Forefront. Front right? and center was Front and about center. everything. And then if you were listening to Led Zeppelin or Journey or that. stuff to that nature around black kids, they were like, what's up with you? Yes. Right? Why, why you ain't listening to Cool in the Gang? Or why are you not listening to Temptations and stuff to that nature, right? So you ain't black enough yes. because you, you listen to so-called right white things. music, right? That's right? right. So that was a culture shock for you. Yes. Okay, so thanks for sharing. Lindsay, tell us a little bit about where you grew up in your background. So I grew up in Fairfield. Absolutely Fairfield. Not Connecticut. Thank you. Sorry. Not diverse at all. Went to college. Went to Central Connecticut. Still in Connecticut. Much more diverse. And it was shocking to me. I The dorm I lived in, um, on the floor I lived in, my two roommates were white. That was about it. Um, and I found a new identity. I found friends I never knew, thought I would be friends with. Did, changed types of foods I ate, music I listened to. 
Um, and that was the first time I started dating somebody that was not my race. And I didn't even realize how much that would affect my parents, my siblings, fa other family members. They were so offended. They were so bothered by it. And I had no idea why. Because for me, it was just a person I was dating. These were just friends I made. And when I came home that summer, I realized a lot was going to have to change for me. I wasn't going to be able to live where I used to live. I wasn't going to stay friends with some of the friends I had. And um, it sort of was like from then on, who I dated, who I hung out with changed dramatically. Um, because I realized there were so many people who weren't racist that were extremely racist. And I just didn't want them in my circle. So, so that, that changed me. That changed you. So, so a little different. Grew up Connecticut, not a lot of diversity. Where you lived at, went to college, diversity, new friends, new food, new experience, started dating people, just fell in love, didn't even care what color they looked like. And then, but that experience changed the people around you, right? In terms of their thoughts who they said they were, you really got to see who they really were. Is that what we... Absolutely, absolutely. The other thing is um, I played a sport in college. And although my team was primarily um, white, the rest of the teams around me were not. Uh, you know, there was a lot of... Uh, there was a lot of diversity. So it wasn't just black, white. I mean, there was... It was very diverse, the athletes were. So those were the people in the circles I traveled in for five years. So that changed also sort of like who I was and what I was about. Thanks for sharing. Shannon. I think I'm realizing all of this as I'm hearing the conversations. I don't really have a, a reflection on myself in that way, if that makes any sense. Um, I also grew up in Connecticut. I grew up in Milford, Connecticut. Um, I live, you know, in a, I guess, a predominantly white neighborhood and in, in school and everything like that. Same with my college. I went to a small private college in New York. Um, I, I don't know if there was ever a moment where I, I felt a shift or, or anything in what I did. Um, uh, my boyfriend in high school was Japanese, I guess, if that means anything. I guess I never really thought about that either. Um, and when I was in college, though, I guess this could be a thing. I guess the music I always listened to, I always listened to hip hop. I always also listened to rock music and things, but I guess I felt very comfortable in different um, ways and with different people. I never really thought about it too much. When I was in college, though, I did um, intern and then I worked for many years at a hip hop radio station in New York. So I guess at that point in time, I was definitely in a situation where I was the minority. Um, again, I didn't feel uncomfortable by that or anything at any particular time. And um, I'm going to say, no, I, no, guess, no. You like, said I don't, I don't really have a moment um, or something in particular to that, that, I guess what there was a shift or anything in particular for me, it was all, I guess, a little more gradual or just just how things play out in life where you end up who you end up with and how your family develops but um yeah. okay so let's 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 piggyback off that so based on where all you grow, grew up at right did you um and you said your first boyfriend or, or you had a boyfriend that was japanese right did you see yourself did you think that you would end up with somebody from another race oh absolutely i i have to say my family Anytime I was like, oh, I was dating someone new, the first question was, is he black? Because for for my family, my immediate family, that would have been a shock. Only because I grew up not just around black boys or men. I, you know, no one expected me. If you lined up the people I dated, they were Pakistani, German, American, you know, just everything you can imagine. So... For me, I it's not at all a shock. It wasn't some major shift in my life that the person that I would, you know, build a family with was not a black person. That was that would be fine. It wasn't that uh, that wasn't an option for me um, or a preference. I you know I don't have a preference. I just 
I'm, it's, it's not surprising in my situation that my spouse is not black. Got it. Is what I'm saying. For me, it was a shock. <laughs> it was, um, I actually remember the moment it came up um, with my parents. Uh, I was driving home from school, um, from college. One weekend, my mom was driving, and I had a friend in the back seat, and he said, um, God, I, I, you know, I heard you in the student center, and um, you were hanging outside of the Black Student Union. Like, what were you doing there? And I was like, oh, just hanging out with friends, and like, my mom, like the car almost like on the highway, like sure. you might as well put it into park. <laughs> And it was like question after question after question. And um, I mean, my father was extremely offended. And uh, things are very, very different now. He Mm -hmm. wouldn't change it for the world. Um, But in that moment, I really shocked my parents and the language my parents used at that time. They have, I mean, they have learned, they have changed who they are, but it was very offensive. It was very difficult time. Um, but it was interesting. I think from that moment on, I kind of was like, this is what I'm attracted to. This is not, you know, you have to be black, but um, the type of person and the interests and the things that we had in common. So from then on, I knew there was going to there w- there was going to be a shift and there was going to be a change. And there was some teasing. There was some fights. There was unkind words. Um, there were girlfriends that were so excited. They wanted, you know, they wanted some like juicy details. Like I have never heard of this other than on TV. I'm like, where, like, where have you been? But then I thought, wait, this was me previously. I wouldn't have known. Right. They, at the end of the day, they was never exposed to that. Right. And so when you grow up in the area, that's all, you know, that's all you see. And then when somebody is, uh, I don't say deviating, but when somebody goes outside of that, then they're like, oh, how does that work? Or whatever the case may be. So go ahead. No, you gonna I was going to say it's one of the, the arguments I would have with black students at my college. What I would say is you cannot expect all these white kids who grow up around folks just like them, exactly. who worship in exactly. institutions that look just like them, exactly. who socialize, who go to school. What do you expect if the only exposure to anything other than themselves is what they have as popular media? How, how are we? Bl- they have no idea. Exposure matters it matters it matters and Lindsay's story is is a perfect example of that she hadn't been exposed it wasn't that she now the story about your parents perhaps is a generational thing but Absolutely. but your exposure and and now your parents exposure to your choices you know you got them on board or or not right but but exposure matters and so uh, it's another thing that attracted me to this conversation is that i think a lot of times people simply don't take the opportunity or don't have the opportunity to be exposed to different things. And this is a, a way to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Jenny, did you think that you, <laughs> uh, <laughs> did you think you were going to be attracted or you think you were going to end up with uh, somebody um, from a different race when you were a kid? You know, I guess I never, again, I never really thought about it. I mm-hmm. feel like I, I need to, I guess, more, do a little more self-reflection or something because <laughs> I, I, it didn't surprise me, no. I wasn't surprised mm-hmm. um, by that at what all. What about your family? Was your family surprised? Um, you know, I I don't even think so. It sound, I sound like the lamest story over here. <laughs> no, but, no, 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 no. It's your story. Go ahead. I mean, it is my story. I, um, I remember, and I thought it was so cute, um, my grandparents, when I told them that my boyfriend was black, at first they were just like, oh, really? Hmm. And then I and, or I showed them a picture. I, I guess I showed them a picture of my now husband Robert. And you know what they said? Their comment was, "Oh my gosh, you look so young. You're robbing the cradle." And he's older than me. And also, I will let you all know. But um, that was really the response. Um, so I think. I mean, I'm sure it what maybe was a little bit surprising, or everybody wasn't in love with the idea at some point somewhere in my family. But it was never. Um, a major topic of conversation. And I really, I didn't grow up in a real um, mixed environment or anything. Most people were white, were where I went. Everybody I thought was Irish or Italian. Everybody was mm-hmm. Catholic until I went to college and found out there was, oh, look at all these Protestants. I mean, it was like, really, I grew up in a very small, tight-knit white community. But I never, I guess, thought about it 
that way or was... But isn't it interesting that you told, had to tell your grandparents, I wonder if you had been dating a white Catholic kid, would you have thought to tell your grandparents? Do you understand yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? Oh, I do. Um, if, if I can interject no, with just a no, quick story. Absolutely. When I was in college, a very good friend of mine um, was from Manhattan, and she inv- white, and she invited me home for Thanksgiving because, of course, I wasn't flying to Germany for thanks for Thanksgiving. And so um, she was a good friend and she invited me to her house. And I went to her house, um, very wealthy, white, upper class neighborhood. And she had clearly told her parents that she was bringing me. But somebody forgot to tell the her aunt and uncle at whose home we were having Thanksgiving dinner. And when they opened the door, the I mean, the world stopped and the they wouldn't touch. They wouldn't shake my hand. I put my hand out, and they they just didn't. They, it didn't register, and so I was thinking to myself, "Oop! Somebody forgot to say that you know the black girl is coming for Thanksgiving dinner," and you know because of who I am, it didn't end badly, and they eventually you know recovered and allowed me to eat in their home, but um, it was clearly uncomfortable for them, and I. Um, think that exposure that they had made it. Now, I'm not saying then every black person that came to their door they would touch, but what I'm saying is, is that they were like, "Wow, she's yeah, like a human being. Yeah, 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 she's a human being. A teachable moment. It was a teachable and, moment. And again, because of who I am, right? That could have really gone left, right? Depending on the person. Yeah, depending and then, on then the they, person. They would have painted a broad brush for everybody. Yes. Right? Go ahead, Shannon. Well, that's very nice that you're. Talking about how they felt, but how did you feel? I mean, that's I'm I, so you know, sorry. I felt yeah, I felt bad. Like, but I understand. I'm overly empathetic. Is the problem sometimes a different person, a you know, a cousin of mine or somebody else in my family? It would not have gone well. But because, like I said, because of who I am, um, I mean, I felt like, oh gosh, somebody forgot to tell you. Do you know I mean I didn't feel like you racist mf or how you know how dare you? I just felt like. We forgot to warn you. Sorry. You know, I I felt because I, you know, it's I think, again, exposure matters. Right. It was clear that these people had never had someone other than a white person in their home for a meal. That was crystal clear to me. But. I felt like that as long as I extended some grace and didn't automatically assume my assumption was this is new for you my assumption was not you're a horrible wretched person because this is new for you Mm -hmm. and let me expose you a little bit to how we're you know i like turkey you like turkey i you know i'm interested you know i want this team to win the game this year and it was fine um so i didn't I don't know. I felt like uh, I sort of felt like, you know, they just didn't get the notice and because they would have pulled it together. Right. Maybe. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> or not. So, I mean, but at the end of the day, it was really about. You as a person. Right. You didn't let the situation you could have. Yeah. Like you 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 were very empathetic in that situation. Right. Um, so that's that shows what type of person mm. that you are, to be fair. You know, if anybody comes to some, if you know, a white person comes to my door, regardless if somebody tells me or not, I'm not going to be shocked. <laughs> all right. I mean, at the end of the day, can I help you? Right. right all right? right. So, right. so that should be just common courtesy. But you, you made the uh, situation uh, very positive. But speaking of that, let's let's now let's let's jettison forward. You're all married now, right? When you first got married, you all have kids now. They're teenagers. All right. When you first got married, knowing the experiences that you dealt with up to getting married with your spouse, did you and your spouse sit down and talk about what you would have to deal with, what your kids would have to deal with in terms of your relationship? Anybody jump in? Well, I'm not married. Okay. So that was like, uh, you know, another negative in the box, right? So... The problem was the thing that would come up and my situation may, is probably different. Um, my partner had other kids already. And so there was a lot of negative things we had to deal with prior because mm-hmm. it was, this is a black person. They already have children. There was, 
you know, um, prejudice about that type of person um, and the thought of that um, there were too many black men like that out there. So actually a lot of these conversations happened um, and then we had our children and then it kind of, the conversations we talked about were based on the color of their skin. My daughter's a little darker than my son is. My, you know, they both have blue eyes. That is not typical. So we kind of talked about how they would be treated based on sort of what they looked like. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the conversations we had to have. Um, but he had already gone through that already once. But even with the children, you know, our children look different. So, how, you know, how will they be treated based on that? What did you think of that, though? Because you didn't grow up that way. Now you're about to have kids. And like you said, your, 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 your partner basically like, he dealt with that throughout his life. Now your kid's going to probably have to deal with that. So what was your thought process when you guys sat down and talked about it? The first thing we talked about was school. So they were absolutely not going to the schools I went to. Um, and we had to very carefully decide. So they went to a magnet school. They went to a very diverse school. When we were signing them up for baseball, when we were signing them up for dance, all of that stuff had to be pre-planned out and really thought about, are these diverse areas? Will they be accepted? Um, I really had to think about, uh, as far as, you know, sports, are they, you know, going to be like the token black kid that, that thought process, oh, they're going to be really great because they're half black, half white. Um, even with dance, we had to deal with that. So the conversations we had more were, how are we going to put them in a place that they're going to feel good, feel accepted, feel related to other kids. Wow. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else? I remember um, a conversation that I overheard or that I was a part of um, before I had children or before I was married or anything. And my cousin um, has a daughter with a black man and I was together with my cousin's daughter. I also call my cousin and her dad. And we were talking or whatever, and he was telling her how she's black. And I was like maybe 18 and I was almost like offended as the white person. Like, well, what do you mean? She's black. She's also white. And he's like, she's black. Everyone will see her as black. She has to identify as black. And I don't know. It like, it like hurt my heart a little bit at the moment that like you can't just be who you are or that a child has to think of how they're seen by others, not how they feel. And just to identify, I guess in those two ways, like you feel how you feel, but other people will see you and judge you based on how they see you. And I guess that's just always something that really, really stuck with me. And that's uh, literally exactly the conversation that my white husband and I had. Now, let me just say, I could not have married a whiter man. Not possible. <laughs> He's from Iowa. He drove a pickup truck. He likes all heavy metal. All, he, <laughs> is, he is, when you, if you were to see him, He's blonde with blue eyes. When I tell you I couldn't have married a whiter man, I could not have married a whiter man. But one of the many things I love about my husband is that he is not at all what you think you see. Um, and the conversation we had was understand that our children will be treated by the world as black children. As a black mother, that's what I had to explain to my white husband. Um, what did he think of that when you said that to him? He didn't disagree. He didn't disagree. Um, but I, I can really identify, um, Shannon, with the hurting your heart because one of the things that has been very difficult for me as the mother of biracial black and white girls is that I tell them and I try to show them through what I do, do not let people make you choose. Your father is white forever and ever, amen, no matter what happens. That's your daddy. I'm your mama. And I'm black and people are going to make you, white kids and black kids are going to try to make you choose. Do not fall into that trap of having to choose. Identify with who it is that you are. And so, but I can really identify with that because I, I knew the world, you know, the world says, or American society says, be yourself. Oh, no, 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 not like that. Do it this way, right? So I wanted my girls to be very um, confident in who they are, but understand that, you know, 
sometimes, you know, there's a joke in our family. Um, you know, one girl will do something. She'll say, you know, I'm tapping into my white side right now or I'm tapping into my black side. But they understand that the world is going to try to make them choose and they resist that because of what their dad and I have instilled in them. I can also say, having speaking of tapping into white and black sides, the other thing we discussed was the things that we were – going to have to do as an interracial couple. So for example, buying a car, I would go in and pick the car that I wanted and then send my white husband in to get the car because he got the better deal. Or and I I am sure this this group has lots of stories about, you know, being the white mom or the black dad or the you know, we have lots of stories like that. But so the other thing we talked about even with our children is who we were going to send in to get something accomplished. Are we sending the black mama in? So every you know, or are we sending black you know white dad in? What are what are we what are we doing with that? So those were the discussions we had in response to your question about what our children were going to have to experience. So we're going to come back to that because I want to ask because I know you guys all got stories about that, but I want to get Lindsay's point of view on the question because I know you wanted to jump in. Um, what Shannon said was something I had to learn. So from the beginning, um. Family members, people would say, well, no, now they're black. Like, you have black children. And I had other friends would say, no, you have mixed children. And I I personally, it's my own thing. I don't like mixed. To me, it sounds like a dog, an animal. I prefer biracial. I prefer mm-hmm. black and white. Best of both worlds. Like, I feel like there's all these different things. But I was offended. And I would be like, no, they're not just black. But there were times where people would say things like, well, you're so lucky because your kid's skin is so light or their eyes are blue. And then I would jump on the, they're black. <laughs> they're black. You, wait a minute, wait yeah, a yeah. minute. Now they're black. Okay. You know, it was kind of because like- Because they're making a point. Right. They're because trying, they were trying, trying to, to make, make them it, yeah. just white. Right. But it was funny because it, I was being told, if they're black, they're black. I don't care if it's 1%. I don't care if it's 50%. And I would be on the- team sort of of Shannon, like, wait, they're both. It doesn't matter the percentage. But when it came down to it or anyone ever challenged that my children were whiter or, you know, their eyes, their hair, things like that came into play, I was like, my black children, like they became black and not white. They were not biracial. They were not, you know, both. They were black then. So I have gone back and forth in my life in experiences on what I want them to be represented as. Because if I wanted to advocate or I didn't like how someone was trying to make them whiter than they were, that bothered me. Mm. So I became, nope, there's that like 1%. So they're black. So speak to that a little. Let's let's dive into that a little bit further, right? What some of the, you know, you just spoke about it where somebody says, oh, luckily they have light skin, which means that they would have some type of privilege or they wouldn't be seen as black, right? So tell us a little bit about some of the experiences that you guys have had as it it could be with you and your husband. It could be with you walking around with your kids. Let's talk a little bit, dive into a little bit of that stuff. And then your responses, or more importantly, how did it make you feel when you, when society was dealing with you with these different type of microaggressions and stuff to that nature? Oh my gosh, if I if you guys let me talk, we'll be here A for the next 3 hours. <laughs> I so my husband has 3 children from a first marriage to a white woman. She's she's got a Mexican um parent, I think, but white. And I can remember going to visit um you know, we would go to visit the three white children. And I'm the black stepmother and we would always go to a hotel with a pool and I would have, you know, the I won't name anybody, but um, my stepson, the little one, I'd be holding his hand. My stepdaughter would be on my back and the other child would be with my husband and they were ahead of us because, of course, the little ones are, you know, tagging, you know, behind and minding somebody else's business. And so they we were going to the restaurant and my husband and his white son got up to the hostess stand first and. You know, here I come two minutes later with these white children all over me. And the hostess said, oh, can I help you? Now, you said I couldn't curse. 
<laughs> I said, I wanted to say exactly who do you, am I the nanny? But I held it together because, you know, she don't know. So that happens a lot. I can't possibly be with this blonde haired, blue eyed man. I'm the babysitter. I'm the I'm somebody other than that next story. And I have I could we could do this all day. When I had my daughter, I am literally holding my child that just came out of me. My white husband went to get the car. I'm in the hospital. My white husband went to get the car. My white girlfriend is with me, you know, with my little bag, and we're waiting. And this older white woman came up. She had to be maybe in her 70s. Sweet grandmother woman. She said, oh, what a beautiful baby. Do you know her name? Now, you said I can't curse. There are no words to describe what it feels like to be asked by someone baby that I am holding this child and you want to know if I know her name, but she caught me on a good day. Again, it's because of who I am. And I just said, you know, her name is Sophia because she wasn't trying to start trouble, right? She was just commenting on my beautiful child, but it didn't occur to her. It never crossed her mind that that was my child. And, you know, if my children hadn't called me mama, a lot of times people would have had no idea that they were my children. Um, so, you know, I can go on and on. I can tell you about stories where my husband and I walk into a restaurant and there are black couples sitting at a table. And when I tell you we ruin their night by just coming in and being seated and, you know, I, black women are upset black men are upset black men in particular are upset but everybody's upset like why are you two together is sort of the message and not only so let me and here's the kicker how does that affect them I <laughs> and their life right right they're, they're what who i'm with or what my kids look like how does that affect you but i can how does that yeah. make your life terrible but i can tell you this is an american thing and that's not to say that there is not racism everywhere i'm pretty well traveled i promise you this color thing we have going on in this country is unique to this country when i'm in Istanbul, for example, the color of my skin is not the same issue as it's about, you know, if I'm hardworking or what it, it's just your characteristics. Different. We don't have yeah. the same. That's a it's a um, typical uh, typical is not the right word. It's a it's an American it's thing. American. I can't yeah. think of the word I'm thinking of, but it's and that's not to say there isn't racism. Of course, there's racism all over, but it's a special colorism thing we have going on here where if there's a drop of black blood in you, then everybody's treating you like you're black regardless that, of what you look like. That, that's in the law, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Is that so, still in the law? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, I was thinking <laughs> yeah. that, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. That's in the in law. Mind. That's yeah. not just people thinking that. Yeah. That's written, okay? Uh, so, so, but thanks for sharing. I know you could be here all day. All right. I can imagine. <laughs> right. I just get upset when, you know, my wife is white and, you know, we've had our issues wherever we go. Right. And it's like, why is this your why are you upset? Why is this your problem? Who I'm with? All right. It has nothing to do with you. Then How does this affect your life? Right. So that's why I don't understand. And this is one of the reasons why we want to have these conversations, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, and I was going to ask you guys this, and you kind of spoke to a little bit like what attracted you to your partner. At the end of the day, life is about being happy. It's about finding somebody that you love and that you can grow a family with and you're on the same page with and you can build certain things together and make sure your kids are able to be, mm. surpass you. That's what life's yeah. about. It doesn't matter mm. what if, 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 if Erica is with such and such or Lindsay is with whoever or I'm or Shan. It doesn't matter. So that's what really bugs me about the situation. But some of that has to do, I mean, there are lots of reasons, but some of that, why it bothers the black, I can imagine, Lindsay, that you get this a lot. Black women are unhappy about what you got going on. I can imagine. It is really hard. Yes. Waitresses going through the airport. There are things that happen where um, we will be out to dinner. Waitress will not look me in the eye. I'm here. I'd like to order dinner, too. No, you don't get um, to order. 
And I, black you know, waitress. Black, of course, <laughs> yeah. of course. Right. Sometimes I want to say brown. Right, right. It could, could be, be some bad. It right. could be I, non-white. I am yes, non-white. Mm-hmm. I am offensive to people, um, and they they have a visceral reaction sometimes, and I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, I can't help you here. But I'm still here, so you're going to have to acknowledge But me. some of it has to do with our history in this country. When we were talking about exposure matters, right? some of why she's upset, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because that exposure, bef- you know, not too long ago, we didn't, the communities didn't mix, right? Intermingle. Black yeah, people yeah. hung out with black folks and worshipped in the same place and worked in the same places and sat in the back of the bus together, and right? And you didn't have, there wasn't an opportunity, lots of opportunities, for there to be exposure to other races other than what you were. That That's how it was. And with um, the effects of slavery and racism in the United States, how white is the standard, your blonde hair, your blue eyes, your, you know, fair skin, all of that is the standard. So when our men choose you, it feels like we are rejected. That's some of what black women got going on. Absolutely. Some and I of have it. friends that have explained this to me yes. and had this conversation yes. with me. Um, and I always joke, I said, I could introduce you to 20 white guys. <laughs> Let me right. know who you want to pick, you know, and kind of becomes a joke, not really funny, but yeah. it's sometimes the way to lighten the mood mm-hmm. or to say, I hear you. I hear you. I can't tell you why we ended up together. There were things we had in common mm-hmm. that we mm-hmm. liked each other. But here's the thing, though. And, and, and again, if they dated your husband, they probably wouldn't want to be with him. <laughs> right. mm-hmm. Because they're not a not a fit. It's not a man. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so so that's my point here. I get the historical stuff. I get that. But at the end of the day, who I walk in with has nothing to do with you. Because what different so if I walk in with somebody black, you gonna jump up and down and start dancing? <laughs> right. <laughs> you're not, the, you yeah, don't get that reaction. It, it, yeah. it doesn't it shouldn't matter, right? It really shouldn't, because if the ultimate goal is to find somebody that you're attracted to, that you fall in love with, and you build a family and you're happy, what difference does it make? One of my best friends grew up in a upper middle class black community in California, and her parents used to tell her, they're part of sort of the black elite, father was a doctor, but they used to tell her, do not date white men because you can't help who you fall in love with, and they did not want her to come home with someone that wasn't black. That was like not okay. And so of course she didn't follow that <laughs> and she but but she's the type of person that, you know, when we go somewhere we went we were in um Madeira, Portugal and I loved it. And I said, "Oh my gosh, I could live here." And she said, "Uh, I don't think I could live here. There aren't enough black people." And I was and we talked about how odd it was that that was on the top of her list for where to live. Right. For me, my own personal journey, that wasn't a priority. But for her, it was a real priority. And those are the women that are going to give you problems, the ones who need, you know, who need that. So everyone has I mean, there are lots of reasons, but um, it is really I feel so badly for for people, us who have to experience this, because it's just like, wow, like, you know, not only is it none of your business, but. I'm not with this person because he's black or because exactly. he's white. Exactly. I'm with him because I, ha- exactly. I wanted to raise a family with this person. Exactly. They have, you know, we share the same values. So, yeah, it's that's a tough one. Shannon, jump in here. I mean, I agree. I think it's, it's, I mean, it's tough. You know, you never know what other people are going to be saying or what they're going to be doing. Everybody's had an experience where you're offended or you feel bad because of how somebody else makes you feel. But... For the most part, I feel like you just got, you just, I mean, you just have to navigate, right? Everybody has a different set of circumstances, um, how people are going to respond to you and how you respond back to them. Um, but overall, I mean, I would say that everything, I mean, everyone's saying sort of the same thing in our group that, right. you know, it's, I, this isn't, I mean, I fell in love with my boyfriend. We got married. We had children. We're a family. If we bother you, uh, look the other way. I mean, there's nothing I'm going to, I'm not going to change who I am. I'm so proud of my family and my children and my husband. And, you know, like I said, hopefully having conversations like this and learning and meeting other people and having exposure to other people 
will help you understand. We're not, I'm not doing anything to offend you. I'm not trying to bother you or my husband's not trying to bother you by being who he is. We're just who we are. And, you know, hopefully we can hang out and have some conversation and get along. I don't know. I I'm glad you said everyone has a, a different set of circumstances. My husband at work had a picture of me and and his children because we didn't have children at the time. And a coworker came by and said, oh, my girlfriend's black too. And my husband said, this is not a club. <laughs> this is not like, right? This is not some club we belong to. And he was so offended by this. You know, it was a white coworker who felt like, oh, you know, like it was some secret a club honor. or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. My, my girlfriend's black too. He was like, yeah, okay, get away from me. But those Go things, ahead, I was going to say, those things happen all over the place. Um, I'm a teacher. I was at work one time and um, another colleague of mine offended um, some African-American guests at our school and the principal wanted to check in. She comes marching to my room. She wants to talk about it. I'm like, how come you're asking me? I mean, I can give you some insight, but regardless of the color of my skin, regardless of my partner, regardless of my children, all of those jokes were not okay. Whether the people they made those jokes to were white, they were black, they could have been Hispanic, they could have been Asian, it didn't matter. The jokes were not appropriate for work. They weren't appropriate for a group of people you are not close friends with. So you can come and ask me, you know, should they have been offended? How can we fix this? You should be, you should, anybody should have been offended by the jokes that were made. And anybody should have um, realized, regardless of color of skin, that wasn't appropriate for the workplace. Mm -hmm. So the stop should be there. If you're coming to me, do you, I, I, do you want me to say it's okay it happened or it was okay that these guests were offended? I can understand, I can relate, but also my skin's not black. So I can say, I would have been offended if I was them, but I don't know what it feels like. Right. And even, I can't tell you what they're going to think, how they're going to feel, but an apology has to happen right away. But when that apology comes out, it has to be more than just because of the color of their skin, because it has to say, we represent a community where this isn't tolerated for anybody. And I think sometimes that's those lines still get blurred too, but often if it does have to do with race, and someone might come and check in with me, like let's let's see how this is. Like, You're the expert. Can you because understand? You, you, like yeah. you know, I know you can help me out because mm -hmm. you know you have black individuals in your family. It's like no, you check yourself. Like you have to know what's right or what's wrong. Yeah, how do you don't not know? check with somebody because of what their family's made up of? But sometimes I feel like our children will be the people who will move the needle forward, right? Because when I hear you telling this story, what I think about is allyship, right? And why is it that <clears throat> white people rely on non-white people to fix it, to address it, to tell us if it's okay? If you feel uncomfortable as a white person in a situation where there is some remark being made that you feel is racist or makes you uncomfortable, there isn't anything wrong with speaking up and saying, right, hey, right. right? But but society has us going to the either the white women married to black men or ha or, or having children with, with black men or black folks to say, oh, you know, what should we do here? So I feel like our children who are biracial may be the ones that 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 help us progress in that sense. In other words, because they have you know, white family members and black family members, they have these experiences and they have to navigate these identity issues that maybe they are the ones that are going to teach us about what it truly means to be an ally so that we can, you know, if we keep having these conversations, because we can't solve the racism problem because we don't ever want to talk about it, right? Or we're not talking to the right people. Well, I, I think though, and, and, and that's the goal, right? Hopefully the generations progress. Um, and I thought that when I was a young kid. And we're still having this issue, okay? And the reason we're having this issue is because, to your point, nobody's talking about it. So at the end of the day, we can't rely on our kids. We have to 
black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Jewish, we have to be uncomfortable and have these conversations ourselves. But Tony, it's not that we're not talking about it. We are. The problem is the right people aren't talking well, about it. Well, here's the thing, though. It, it's being talked about, but it's being talked about from a divisive standpoint. Mm -hmm. It's being mm -hmm. talked about to divide people, right? Mm -hmm. So because there's a strategy, all right, to, to hold power, right? So they don't want people to come together. Think about it for a second. If, if it really was about bringing people together, listen to any leader. I don't care what political affiliation they belong to. There's nothing coming out of their mouths about bringing people together. It's always talking about what this group is going to take from you and these people trying to replace you and this and that. It's about dividing people, okay? Because if we came together, we wouldn't, to be honest, those people wouldn't even be in power. So the key is it's among us, these grassroots conversations, to have these conversations. Now, do they have to be in a safe space where, you know, because the fear, reason we don't have these conversations is because people are afraid they're going to get attacked or they're going to get canceled out or, you know, they're going to be judged as a racist or, or, you know, at the end of the day, and I get that, we got to drop that too. We People, I'm black, I've made a million mistakes in, in other different ethnicities and stuff to that nature, right? I didn't know, right? So how to, back to where we started this conversation, how can somebody grow up in Montana where there's no diversity around them, okay, and they're supposed to know everything about diverse, a diverse population? They wouldn't, okay? So we got to be smart enough, and guess what? Some people can grow up in Long Island or in Fairfield, Connecticut. I'm not picking on Fairfield, but whatever. If you live in an area and you don't have diversity around you, you're not going to know. So we got to be okay with that, but we got those people got to be willing to be educated. And we got to be willing to, to give them a, throw them an olive branch. And if they make a mistake, as long as, you know, going back to your school situation, if somebody makes a mistake, as long as they're like, look, what did I do wrong? I want to correct this. And it's sincere. Then guess what? They just became better because they learned something. Right. So final thoughts, final question I have for you ladies real quick. How would, if, if, if there's people right now that's watching this, that's listening to this, they're in an interracial relationship or they're, 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 they're about to get in or they're in one and they're about to have kids or they have kids and their kids are dealing with the same things that your kids are doing. What advice would you give them in terms of bringing their kids up, having multiple identities and navigating the world and being strong in who they are so they can take on or become anything that they want to become? I go back to my don't let the world make you choose if you're black or white. Be who you are. Um, you know, my mother taught me that my job on the planet was to leave the world a better place than how I found it. So your your goal in life is to to contribute something to the world to make it better, whatever that is, whatever that is. And exposure matters. Um, you know... Talk to people, be in other places, travel, do things that you normally wouldn't do. Put yourself in situations where there are people that are not like you, different religions, different, you know, value system and, you know, learn in, in that way. I think you have to sit down and have a conversation with your partner about what your goals are for your children and everything else follows from that. I would say also go out of your comfort zone. So you have to, you have to show your children it all, your black family, your white family. You have to give them opportunities to experience diversity, I would think. And I think what I advice I would give is, um, is, you know, make sure your children are somewhere where they're comfortable, where they're learning and these conversations can happen. So you know, what schools they go to, what activities they do, you know, just give them as many opportunities to be around all, like all people. That would be mine. It's, you know, even if I lived in a pri primarily black community, still taking my children to go into a white community or because I am also white or vice versa. So you need to give them experiences, opportunities. Um, with all people. Mm. That would be my piece of advice. Not just stick to what's close and easy. Right. 
I agree with both my fellow moms here, and I've had a wonderful time speaking with them today. Um, I think the only, obviously everything they said I agree with, and the only other part I was going to add was just make your, just make sure, like any parent, that you have your kids feel loved and confident and um, just build the strength within them in your own home and that they can feel strong and happy and safe to talk to you about anything that comes up and... Um, hopefully between that, their family unit, they're in all the exposure and the programs and things that they're in, they'll be able to have a great life and leave the world a better place than they came in. <laughs> awesome. Final thoughts, ladies. What do you want to leave the audience uh, about this conversation? What do you want them to walk away with? Keep talking. Keep the conversations going. You know, I am still talking to my son. I think it was about your daughter. And hair. We talk about hair with our daughters. Ask for help. <laughs> so if you don't, you know, I'm not just saying about hair, but if you don't know something, ask for it. I need help with my daughter's hair, and I go and get it. Um, I had to explain to Cameron the things he thought your daughter did not experience. My daughter experiences them all the time. So I would just say keep those conversations going. Speaking of hair, I have to say this. I, <clears throat> You asked, Tony, about conversations we had with our partners um, before we had children or having biracial children is that I literally threatened my husband's life because I said, do not have my child. Cause I have girls do not have my child going to school, looking homeless. You are going to learn how to do this. And I have proof of, you know, him doing their hair. And I will never forget the day I brought my old, our oldest Sophia to daycare and, um, the the white teachers were like, oh, it was preschool. Oh, we just love how you did Sophia's hair today. I said, oh, I did not do it. Their daddy did it. <gasps> we sucked all the air out of the room. But it was literally something that was really important to me because as a black woman, as a mother, I can pick out the biracial kids whose white mamas didn't know what to do with their hair. I know them. And I... <laughs> And I, I offer my services, but I, that was a conversation I had with my husband and he rose to the challenge probably because he was afraid of what would happen if he didn't rise to the challenge. But he, you know, you, you make these, I don't want to call them compromises, but you learn what it is that needs to happen for your children. Absolutely. You know, that you may not have that experience with and you know, that's, it's great. So call me. <laughs> I'm good now. I got it now. <laughs> we probably could have a whole show on here. I mean, really. I mean, I think, you know, who's who tells you what to do with somebody's hair, who doesn't know how to do hair, who wishes they had someone to talk to, whatever it is. We could definitely have a show on here. But um, yeah, I agree. Have the keep the conversations open. Um, always feel like empower yourself to say things sometimes when you hear something that you don't like or that you just think, you know what, I could just give a little perspective on that and jump into a conversation because a lot of times people aren't saying things to be offensive or to offend anyone else. They just don't know. So don't if you know. have a different perspective, bring it to the table, get the conversation going, open things up and open your heart and pay attention. Listen, be a good person. Well, number one, we thank you guys for coming on and opening it up and paying attention and sharing uh, your experiences, and your perspective. So, you know, Lindsay, Erica, Shannon, we want to thank you for appearing here on the Black Executive Perspective Podcast and talking about a very difficult topic. And we're going to keep the conversation going. We're going to have a, another uh, uh, episode. We're going to keep talking about this because we want to continue to educate people. So thank you. Really appreciate it. Love each of you. And so I think now it's time for Tony's Tidbit. So now it's time for Tony's Tidbit. So the tidbit today is biracial families are the living, breathing example of love's triumph over societal divisions, shining a light on the path towards a more inclusive world. And I'm pretty sure you got that today with our guests. So we really appreciate you joining a Black Executive Perspective podcast. You can tune in to our next episodes wherever you get your podcasts and you can follow us on all our social channels, LinkedIn, X, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram on exact, uh, excuse me, black, a black exec. For my fabulous guests, 
My man in the background, Double A, who makes this happen. I'm Tony Tidbit. We talked about it. We love you. And we're out. A Black Executive Perspective.